And this is the first of a new series called Bringing It Home. Um, the, the idea came up in a, in a brainstorm with Reggie and Sharon about we have this sitting at the feet of elders, great conversations, and what, what a delight it would be to have time to really work together and have conversation in a much more interactive, different format. Um, and so we're thrilled to have you all here. I do want to do some housekeeping. First, I'm Missy Rents. I'm with the Wellbeing Project. You are, you are here for bringing it home with Sharon Salzberg and Reggie Hubbard. Um, and I wanna just do a little housekeeping before I hand it over to them. You, uh, you got the alert that we are recording. I wanna let you all know that we will only be recording until we do breakout, breakout groups and um, an interaction with you all. We really are committed to making a very safe and, and, and brave space for conversation and don't want that to be something that is shared amongst, um, amongst the public. So just wanna assure you of that, um, that this will definitely be an edited down um, recap when you go, if you ever wanna go back and see it. So with that, I welcome everybody. We are thrilled that you're here and um, I, will, I will send it over to, to Reggie and Sharon. And thank you all very much for hosting this conversation. Missy, thank you for the introduction. Uh, Izaki, thank you for the tech support in advance and blessings and peace to all. Uh, happy to be in community with you today as the, I wouldn't say practical, but just I'm an organizer um, and I love great conversations, but I love like talking to real people about stuff too, right? Like, um, and especially with respect to the concept of eldership, um, we live in a society in the West, particularly where um, people are disposable. And like eldership is not just a philosophical concept to me, it is, it is a practice of shifting your mentality uh, to being more intergenerational and communitarian and talking about these sorts of things, right? So that's why I'm excited to be with you today. Sharon, if you have any uh, welcome remarks, please offer them and then I'll lead us in a practice. Uh, I will just say hello and um, thank you so much for, for joining us here together. We'll have a group conversation in many ways. Cool. Well, y'all, the other part of this, too, is that like Sharon and I are um, practitioners and teachers and like we can have a lot of conversation, but if we don't put this into practice, what are we doing? Right? You know, there's a lot of chatter. There are a lot of filibusters, but we need to have like spiritual legislation. We need, we need to get into the act of it. Right? So um, allow the shoulders to shrug and get into a posture through free movement that is organic. <laughs> If you sit over a computer for hours a day, allow the next several moments to be spacious for the torso. Maybe get into the neck, reminding the body what mobility feels like. <clears throat> Another 10 to 15 seconds of welcoming gentle movement before finding stillness. And as you settle the body, as you still the subtle movement, feel the body in space, feel the body where it touches the ground. And don't take that for granted, feel it for the gift that it is. Grounded, not just to the earth, but grounded and connected to one another in this moment, in this virtual space, in this well-being project, and in the upcoming conversation. And when you have a sense of groundedness, shift your attention to the breath in the body. Notice where the breath lands and if there are any particular characteristics. Is it in a location? Does it have a shape or a texture? Is there a temperature? And just give gratitude for the breath in the body. We take the breath for granted when in fact without the breath we don't exist in this plane, in this form. So allow your awareness to be aware of the groundedness and the breath in the body. Because to me that's the alchemy of presence. And begin to shift the breath in the body 
to a depth that suits you in through the nose and out through the nose. Perhaps just breathing in and out, or maybe you say, I am breathing in on the inhale. I am breathing out on the exhale. So it's truly tuning in to what the breath has to say, what the body has to say in this moment. And as you settle into that felt sense of groundedness, as you manipulate the gift of the breath in accordance to your needs, allow the mind to wonder and wander. What brought you here today? What, if anything, are you seeking What do you have to share? Maybe it's a story, maybe it's your presence. But just allowing that curiosity of what brought you here and how we're gonna spend our time together to be the whipped cream and cherry on the Sunday of presence. Even though it's Tuesday, but who's counting? So give the breath depth, give the body softness, and we'll spend the next moment or two in silence and I'll ring a bell at the end of our silence sit. Welcoming yourself back to the space. I bow before you with gratitude for the chance to be of service. That never gets old. <laughs> So thank you all for the chance to be of service. Um, and what I wanna do now is just give ourselves the opportunity to set the table for, for our conversation. Um, just being transparent for those of you who don't know me, I'm very honest and very loving. I'm probably more honest than loving most times, but like, there, there def there's definitely a, a synthesis of the two. Um, the conversation of what eldership means to me is very personal for me right now because in the past two weeks, I've had three deaths in my family, immediate and extended. Um, two of them, uh, one was the best friend, the father of my best friend from high school, and one of them was my father's brother, my uncle. And um, so I'm very present with eldership. I'm very present with the precarious nature of the human experience. And I'm very present with not only sorrow, um, but the joy of having spent time with these folks who have passed on. And when we take one another for granted, um, it, we just do so at our peril. And so that's why the whole conversation with respect to eldership is important to me because we can't take, we can't take one another for granted and we definitely can't take um, t tomorrow for granted. 
Um, and another thing that has been very present with me, and then I'll toss it to Sharon for some of her thoughts, is that um, I feel this very viscerally. Like when the generation before me passes away, you know, and for those of you that were at the first uh, meeting, we talked about being an elder, like I'm an elder in training. Well, one of my training, one of my trainers uh, left. <laughs> Right. So like when the next generation, when the old generation passes, I'm up. Right. So like to some extent in my family, um, the passage of my uncle means the elders in my generation, it's time for us to step up. And so I'm just very present with not taking elders for granted and that when they pass, we are here. And so like I, for instance, uh, this week I had to edit the obituary and I have to give a eulogy. Um, which I which I'm honored to do. It just makes me more present um, with this conversation. So that's how I come before you today, dear Sharon. What say you? Uh, well, I, I approach the. Thank you very much, Reggie, and thank you for the the loving honesty. Um, but I approach the topic from a lot of different angles, realizing to my shock I am an elder because I don't think of myself that way. And uh, mostly, uh, you know, publicly, I've just complained about when I've had to enter my birth year in something and I have to scroll for like an hour and a half to get down to 1952. And I think, well, that's not fair. You know, nobody born in 1999 is going to buy your product or register for your thing, you know, uh, and it's just like a really long way down, um, you know, or I realized I started my meditation practice in January of 1971. And in my first meditation retreat, I met some very close friends, some of whom will actually appear throughout this series, um, like Mirabai Bush. And, and so we have like 50 year memories, which is, it, it shocks me, it astonishes me. So is that part of it? And But something you just said, Reggie, really sparked some of the other uh, perspective, which is being a student and having a tremendous regard and gratitude for my own teachers and uh, of whom virtually all of them have died. And I remember watching um, something just, you sparked it so strongly in me, where um, I have a current teacher who's younger than I am, which is nice. Um, and uh, I've known him for a very long time. His name is Sonny Rubache. His father was one of my teachers. And we had a common teacher in this very beautiful Tibetan Lama named Nyosha Ken Rinpoche. So uh, it came to pass that uh, Sonny Rinpoche was going to have a retreat in the States. And uh, Nyosha Ken Rinpoche, known fondly as Kempo, was dying in France. So he went to France on his way to the States and I'd already been there. And um, and then just in the, the very beginning of that retreat, Kempo did die. And I almost felt like I watched parts of Kempo enter Sonny Rinpoche. Like there, were, there was just an energy and there was a um, a power that it was, it was almost like this silent transmission. And, and uh, Sonny Rinpoche was very interesting and I think honest and, and uh, accurate when he said to the assembled group, and I was just there as a student, he said, I feel sorry for you that you're not going to get to study with the great, great masters of old, you know, who had a, obviously a very different kind of cultural conditioning and before the trauma of the, the leaving and losing the country and, um, you know, different kind of training circumstance and uh, he said, you're not getting to study with them, and I feel really bad for you. You're only getting to study with me. Then he said, but I'm what you've got, so I'll do the best I can. And it, it was such a beautiful moment, um, because despite his saying that, I could just, I was just watching him, like, absorb something. And so uh, somehow when you said that, that really came up for me. Yeah, that's a beautiful reflection. I'll share um, the other night when, um, for those of you um, who, when someone passed away, uh, for me, I spent a lot of time looking up at the sky, <laughs> you know, just kind of like, okay, like, you know, either in dis not disoriented per se, but just kind of like, whoa, that's a lot. And y'all, I swear to God, goodness, Buddha, all of them, 
is that um, I was looking up at the sky, like holding space for my uncle. And this has happened like the past three major deaths in my life, like a shooting star. And I was like, hmm, <laughs> like, thanks for the wink. And, you know, this kind of goes to what we're talking about or we want to talk about next in terms of introducing the conversation is the elasticity of time and sharing something that you mentioned um, brings to mind that elasticity and that like, what is a 50 year memory? Right. You know, like to some extent, like you just it probably feels like it's just yesterday for you. Um, I know that the elasticity of time in the context of, of the loss of my uh, best friend's father, um, when I went to the funeral, I hadn't seen my buddy in like 15, 20 years. And it was like, I mean, I got more hair than him. And I don't say that like too much because this could all go away. It, like nature may teach me impermanence. So I'm not going to brag about how much hair I have over my friend. But I will tell you that um, when after the funeral, after listening to his eulogy, I went up to my buddy and kissed his bald head just like I would as we were teenagers. And we were back in that teenage thing. He's like, man, can you believe that like so-and-so from De La Soul died? You know, like all this, like we just were back to where we were uh, 35 years ago. Uh, and that elasticity was beautiful because um, he has like two kids now. Like, it's, it's just to be who we were as we are was a beautiful experience. You know, in, in, you don't take time for granted, but the time that passed since I last saw him was irrelevant. And that was a beautiful experience. And, and, and in many ways, um, as I mourn my uncle, um, the elasticity of time, like he, he, my memories of him predate me in that like my family is very big and very tight. And so um, I'm thinking of, he, he was 74, like um, I'm thinking of the memories that I have that predate me. So when I was talking to my father um, about my uncle, my dad was like, yeah, um, I don't know how I wasn't drafted in Vietnam. Like um, I have my draft card upstairs and it's 1A. And so like that was like six years before I was born, right? So talking to my dad about his draft card, I was present with it, even though I wasn't around. Like, so like that elasticity of time is very present with me, especially in the concept of eldership, because, you know, the one thing I'll say before um, asking Sharon what you think about that is that um, we, um, when someone passes, you realize that you, you knew a lot, but you didn't know everything. And so in the concept of eldership, um, I want us to consider like, how can you, how can we share our stories and or hear stories from other people so that that level of connection passes on. Well, I remember the Vietnam War being older than you. Uh, so we can talk about it sometimes if you want. Um, but I think what you're saying, you know, is very telling because there's both, uh, there's not enough time really. And it goes so fast, like 50 years, it is like a dream. And now I realize that with some of my friends, uh, you know, that I can probably count on the fingers of one hand, likely, how, how many more times I'll see them physically in the same place. Uh, and that's shocking. And yet, you know, there, there can be uh, a degree of openness and especially, I think a lack of regret is very important. You know, I recently, um, had a friend who's uh, quite old and um, his son who must be, you know, between middle age and older age, um, lost his temper with his father. And these things happen, you know, but um, when my friend was telling me about what had transpired, the first thing I said was, he's really going to regret that. I was sure of it, you know, unless he came back and said, well, I, I was overcome or overwhelmed or something like that. And let's talk about the issue now or something like that. But in the absence of that, and just to have had that, uh, it haunts one in the end when you realize too late. And it's so true for so many things in life. Like, I know I won't do everything that I ever wanted to do. Uh, just the things I used to think about. In fact, I did a retreat with that same uh, younger Tibetan teacher, Sonny Rinpoche, who's 
uh, he was just observing his community and realizing people were getting older. And so he did a course on aging. And I was in a place where um, I'd actually fulfilled everything on my bucket list. A bucket list for anyone who doesn't know is this list you sort of make of uh, dreams you have, you know, like before I die, I will walk up Mount Kilimanjaro or whatever it is, you know. So I had a certain number of people I wanted to meet on my bucket list and I met them all. So I said to my friend, Joseph Goldstein, do you think I'm going to die? And he said, make a new list. You know, so I went back, like way back. I thought, you know, someday I'd like to go to journalism school and just study that. And I'd like to do this. And I realized it's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. So I brought this up at the retreat and we we're meeting in a small group. And there was a woman who was a lot older than I who chastised me. And she said, don't think that way. She said, I'm studying Tibet and I'm going to Tibet in a bus tour next month. <laughs> it was like, I don't think so. Uh, you know, so it's not, it, I think the truth for us is some combination. It's some balance of things we realize, just let go of that. You know, it's not a priority, hasn't been a priority, like, uh, and the other things of like, don't limit yourself artificially. Because if it matters to you, then you go for it to some degree or another, or maybe it changes shape somehow. Um, so it's really both. Yeah, it's something that um, you you mentioning about the person who um, got into an argument with their father. Um, so my uncle who passed is my dad's brother. And I, me and my dad have had a pretty interesting relationship over the course of my life. And I know, I know and knew that practice had shifted and changed my whole life when I got the news about, so my dad and my uncle were traveling to a funeral and my uncle fell asleep in the car, in the seat next to my dad and never woke up, right? And so my dad didn't know. So it was just kind of like, huh? Like death, death be showing up times. You're like, wow, that's an interesting one. So I could hear like the pain in my dad's voice. And to your point about regret, Sharon, like, I, like I'll be honest. So for two minutes, I was like, I don't want to deal with this shit. <laughs> I totally was just like, I don't want to deal. Then I took a deep breath, like got present and was just like, what would be of most service right now? And my dad needed to see his son. So I, you know, resourced and went over and hung out with him and ate food and had jokes and was a son to my father. Um, and it was a beautiful experience. Like, I felt like I leveled up. I was like, Reggie, you're kind of grown sometimes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that, uh, like that first two minutes of, I don't want to deal with this shit. This sucks. Like totally had that moment. But then like, once I got into like practice and service and, and the loving space of the, the wisdom of the heart, I was like, your dad needs his son right now and you need to go be with him. And that's been great. And to, to be able to be of service to him in his suffering is like the, the biggest blessing that I could offer. So th th thank you for that uh, reflection because it, it's important, right? It's important. So dear ones, the beautiful thing about bringing it home is that we get a chance to give you food for thought. Um, so we're going to um, break out into breakout rooms um, and ask you to consider the following questions uh, amongst yourselves. The first question is, how do you embrace or serve eldership? Um, and the second question is, can you share a time when eldership was striking for you or when it landed for you or when the whole notion of eldership was, hmm, you know, Stefan, that's cool. That's cool. So for those of you that can make it breakout groups, how do you embrace or serve eldership? And can you share a time when eldership was striking for you? So we will give you 15 minutes to be in the groups if you can um, talk freely, um, share freely, um, and then share that freedom with us when you come back.
And Isak will send us to those rooms now. Period. And, um, and then I'll turn it over to Missy for some closing announcements. So if you want to sit comfortably, let's be at ease. You can close your eyes or not. I like having some kind of structure where I settle my attention on something as a kind of home base, as a resting place, basically. So that could be the feeling, the sensation of the breath, be something else happening in your body. Um, the operative word really is rest. Find something that's happening anyway, like the breath, that you don't have to force or try to fabricate. Bring your attention there and just rest. And this helps establish a sense of some ease, some spaciousness, within which you can observe what arises. Different emotions, different reflections, different resolves, whatever it might be. Allow it to come, allow it to pass. You don't have to make a decision right now about anything. But we want to know what we're feeling. So you can observe these various emotions or ideas, let them go. Return to that object, like the feeling of the breath, and rest. And when you feel ready, you can open your eyes or lift your gaze and we'll end the meditation. So thank you so much. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Reggie. This has been a wonderful conversation. Um, and thank you all of you for participating in, in, this, in this session. I do have a few announcements and some exclusive hot off the presses information for this group only. Um, first, our next webinar for Sitting at the Feet of Elders is next Tuesday, um, March 7th. Let me letting me multitask so I can provide links to you. Um, it is with Parker Palmer and we'll be talking about transitions in time. Uh, there is that one. Then the next bringing it home and go ahead and mark your calendars because every bringing it home is the last Tuesday of every month. So we'll continue to have conversations um, that are really kind of a, a, a wrap up from the previous sitting at the feet of elders. And now your exclusive is that in April, we will be turning the tables and having Maribai Bush join Reggie as a host. And our special guest is Sharon Salzberg. Um, Sharon is coming out with a new book called Real Life. 
um, the journey from isolation to openness and freedom. Um, and we are going to to have a conversation with her. Um, and so Sharon, maybe you can give a couple sentences about what that is about and I'll provide that link while she's talking. <laughs> That's great. Uh, this is my assignment is to be able to give an elevator pitch, you know, as though the elevator doors were closing, but I'm not ready. Um, uh, it's basically something I wrote while in lockdown here. Um, and it has a lot to do with the movement from constriction, those habits and those forces that have us feel shut down and enclosed and lonely and uh, trapped to expansion, to openness, to connection, to freedom, and how to work with the, the forces that we're habituated to that do close us down because they're all workable and how to cultivate and enjoy the, the fruits of, of that kind of openness so we're very excited sharon thank you very much and not only um you won't find this and that was an excellent elevator pitch <laughs> so homework <laughs> assignment achieved that thank was awesome. you thank you that was awesome um, and and it's not on the website yet i did provide the link it'll be there in a few days and sharon has been really gracious enough the book comes out on april 12th 11th 11th, the week after the sitting at the feet of elders, but we are going to do a book club with her. And so um, when it comes out, if you're interested, you'll be able to um, grab a copy. We'll give you a month or two to read it. And then Sharon will come back and we'll have a dedicated episode of um, webinar where she will come back and help us book club this book. So Sharon, thank you. Thanks to all of you for participating today. Hope you enjoyed it. It's the first of its kind for us. And we um, hope to see you back every month. And um, with that, we hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Feel free to turn off your to, to turn on your cameras and bid adieu. So thank you. Gratitude, love, and grace. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. It was lovely. Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Bye bye. Gratitude. Thank you so much, everyone. It was amazing. I really enjoyed.